at this time, we are going to start recording this webinar. Uh, thank you all for participating in today's webinar um, and to learn a little bit about the clinical progress monitoring tool. Um, as you've noticed, I have uh, muted all of the uh, participants. Um, the goal of this is not to necessarily field um, questions, but to be able to give an overview of the webinar. And then we'll end with the opportunity to be able to email in questions where we can create a question and answer or frequently asked questions tool um, that we'll be able to provide that with all of the participants uh, within the Illinois Heals program. Um, all of you all should know about Illinois Heals at this particular point, helping everyone access link systems. We're very excited to be able to offer supports for organizations to be able to provide highest quality or higher quality services. Um, in that we want to support certain evidence-based practices that have been more challenging to implement within Southern Illinois. Um, this project serves Celine, Gallatin, White, Franklin, and Williamson counties um, and has multiple subcontracting agencies that will be implementing these effective treatments utilizing an enhanced evidence-based practice rate. Um, that enhanced rate um, is to be able to cover the cost of the additional requirements, the additional work that, it, that comes with doing higher quality practices. That includes specialized supervision, uh, participating in trainings um, and consultation calls, um, as well as clinical progress monitoring. Clinical progress monitoring will be the focus of today's webinar. Um, and as I said before, this is recorded um, and will be available to all participants following this webinar. Within the Illinois Hills system, we're using Google Drive and within Google Drive, what we want to be able to do is avoid using any type of protected health information. Um, the goal of this is to be able to allow for a multi access point for the information versus having to manually enter information in other systems or communicate information um, in other methodologies other than an online cloud platform. Um, so on this platform, there are a few things we want to avoid. We want to avoid certain uh, protected health information um, within this, uh, this tool. Um, but the tool is made not only to be able to share information, but it's really made to be able to enhance the quality of my practice. Enhance the quality of my practice in a way that I'm using real-time feedback on uh, my clients progressing or maybe not progressing or my clients digressing or maybe not digressing and then I can use that information in addition to the research that's available to be able to make the best decisions for my client. Um, individualized and adaptable approaches are all part of each of these evidence-based practices. The ones that we're supporting through this project are EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, Parent-Child Interaction Therapy, or PCIT, Trauma-Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or TFCBT, and Trauma-Informed Managing and Adapting Practices, or MAP. Um, these particular practices will all require the use of this clinical progress monitoring tool, um, and this information will be pulled down from um, Maddie Schneider, who will be able to lessen the burden on organizations to be able to share information for this particular project. Um, with me today is Liz Cooley, who is the System of Care Coordinator for this project, um, and Maddie Schneider, who is the Services Coordinator, who will be your liaison um, throughout this project. Um, so first, what I'm getting into is um, I will have access, if I'm a provider for, let's say it's Egyptian Health Department, I will have access to my folder only. Um, organizations can set this up in different ways, and we can create um, different access um, levels for different providers depending on what you need but if i'm provider one i only need to see my clients in that within each one of the provider folders will be a copy of the master copy of the clinical progress monitoring tool for illinois hills at this particular point i'm just going to walk through what does the tool consist of what are some of the items that are required within the tool and how can you best utilize the tool for monitoring clinical progress and um, improving outcomes with clients. Um, and if you wanted more information about improving outcomes, you can um, study or look up Leonard Bickman has a lot in that particular area of the just the effect sizes or effectiveness of 
progress monitoring or clinical progress monitoring or outcome monitoring alone and how that creates better outcomes. Duncan and Miller are also good resources for this um, if you wanted to get additional or if you want to do additional research in this area. So first I'm going to make a copy because this is the master copy and so I want to make a copy of, of the client um, clinical progress monitoring tool for my particular client. Every client will have their own individualized monitoring tool. So now I have a copy of a copy and I'm going to go ahead and rename that. Um, as time goes on, we, we will end up with a um, formula or system that will be utilized for how to create a code for this. Um, I also encourage that clinicians can, if they want to, they can create nicknames. Remembering those nicknames must be respectful and culturally competent um, and linguistically appropriate. And so um, thinking about um, the impact of those names. And so you can create nicknames for clients that will allow a person to be able to follow. Um, but we will get you, uh, or Liz Cooley will be getting you more of information on the formula for the identification um, number for every client. But let's say we're going to use one like this, that I'm the first clinician, um, and this is the first client that I'm seeing. And then I might have the nickname of of b-ball and in this situation the youth is a profound basketball player um, very interested in basketball and it's just something that helps me recall who this client is so that I don't have to go through and find who is or have a um, cross-reference sheet between client names and the codes at the same time we also encourage that you put this information. So in different electronic health record systems or medical record systems, you might have the code that we're going to use here. You may have that within your system as a nickname or um, also known as. And so that way you're able to be able to um, link your electronic health record system with this system. The other options that might be out there and even more that we're not aware of, um, you may be able to customize your system to be able to incorporate more of the variables and the information that we're collecting here that could um, help really integrate this information or other systems might be able to put a link for every client that will go directly to their clinical progress monitoring tool. So when I'm in the EHR system for client John Doe, I also can click a link that will bring me right to John Doe's um, file, which I have nicknamed him as B-Ball. All right, so case ID, we're going to skip over that for now. That's going to be a system that Liz Cooley will be sharing with us. Um, and then we go into some self-reported variables. And I'm just going to go through item by item to be able to um, just provide guidance. But I know a lot of you all could probably pick this tool up and just start using it immediately. So the first item is about age. We're not looking for specific age. We're looking for age ranges. And so my client might be 13 to 17 years of age. In this, we don't have to put any date of birth or any information like that that could be protected health information. And then I might identify um, that he didn't want to report his gender as an example, and then maybe his racial or ethnic identity, maybe he identifies as black or African American. Then I'm getting into the focus of my treatment. So in Illinois Heals work, we are all focused on addressing the needs of victimization and victims of crime and victims of interpersonal trauma. And so within that context, these treatments will all be tailored pretty close to that, um, especially when we're using things like eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or using things like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. There needs to be justification through an assessment or screening process that will determine that those treatments are appropriate for um, our client. And so within that, um, after you've done some type of screening protocol, and as we've talked about in our last Illinois Heals Advisory Council meeting, what we're doing is that you can use a screener. It might be part of your IM cans if you have that, or IM plus cans, or you can do more informal types of communication that someone is revealing this information. We do not require that there's a specific tool that you use, but in this, you do want to note what type of victimization is the primary focus of my treatment. And so for this youth, maybe the answer is he has witnessed domestic or family violence. 
Sometimes there's also a secondary focus and that my youth also experiences bullying. Um, these are not things that um, you have to justify or that they have to justify to prove to you that these things have happened. Many of this information, much of this information is self-reported um, or reported to us. So if I get a referral from a school system that says that he's being bullied, he doesn't have to prove to me that. I can note it here. So that's in the presentation results. And as you can imagine here, this will be some of the mapping out or graphing of the data that we're gonna put in the next section or next sheet. All right, so here's the sheets down here and I'm just clicking the next sheet um, on this tab that says data progress. For every session that I'm gonna be meeting with my client, what I wanna be able to do is put in the date um, so I'll just put in today's date, uh, or I'll put in one for yesterday and one for today. Um, so yesterday, and then, um, well, the 6th, let me do that instead. And then today, which is the 27th, which is just fine. So maybe I'm seeing them about twice a month in this scenario. And um, then I'm gonna put down what type of service. The only treatments that are reimbursable through the enhanced reimbursement rate are EMDR, TFCBT, MAP, and PCIT. If it does not meet one of these, um, then that might be a note that goes in your EHR system, but may not go into this particular system. Um, but we're only gonna be noting those that are TFCBT, EMDR, et cetera. So let's say I'm doing TFCBT with them. Um, and then within that, there might be a practice category. These practice categories come from managing and adapting practices. Um, these also could be adjusted or new things could be added over time, but maybe I'm doing something like goal setting on my first meeting. But even if it's not in there, and I wanna say that maybe I'm doing affect awareness and modulation, right? So I can name that practice that I'm in. Family members participating. So this is just one item to be able to say like, who's in participation with this client? And so in this situation, the mother was in participation. Units, um, the next piece is to understand about units um, and many of your agencies are very familiar and can provide additional information to you as a practitioner or clinician if you need that. Um, but a unit of service is considered 15 minutes, um, somewhere between eight and 15 minutes. Um, and if it goes up to 22 minutes or 21 minutes, that's typically rounded down to one unit of service. If it's over eight, eight or more minutes, then it's rounded up to one unit of service. And so let's say I saw him then for about 45 minutes, which was three units of service. And then I'm gonna go back to what was the primary focus here, but also what was the primary focus of this session? Maybe this session something happened and in affect awareness and modulation, we're talking about the bullying that occurs to him and that that was a focus of this session. And then we also covered some about domestic violence and the flashbacks that he might be experiencing. So then the primary and secondary don't necessarily have to match the previous primary and secondary. Next is an item to ask, did I provide information about a referral or another system or did I refer them to another system? And so if I did that, let's say I'm gonna refer them over to victim services program. Let's say it's the domestic violence program or um, that's in my community. And I might refer them over so that they can get additional information on orders of protection or certain types of victim advocacy program. And so I, made have I might have referred them that day or maybe I just provide them information about that system and how to get access to that system. So these are the base items. Then as I move forward, um, each one of these will say, please edit. This is where we get the opportunity to customize information that is helpful. And oftentimes I'm using the language that clients have come in with. And so they say, I don't wanna have nightmares anymore. Or I don't wanna have as many flashbacks or I wanna be able to get my work done or I wanna be able to go to work. I don't wanna miss work as many. I wanna increase the number of hours that I'm working. And so there's multiple um, types of possibilities in that. But these are very customizable. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete out measure one and I'm gonna work with my client that, again, maybe they're saying, I want to um, be around more positive adults. 
maybe that's the case, right? That I want to have more adult relationships or I want to be around more positive people or I want to feel safer. And then we find out that perhaps the safest place is school. And um, there's truancy issues and a youth is missing too much school at this particular point, but they also feel safe at school in certain situations. So as long as they're around school staff, they feel safe um, and that the bullying is maybe not happening at school in this scenario. Maybe it's happening in other contexts in the youth's life. So let's say then we come up with a compromise or a goal that might be to increase attendance at school. So then a variable that I might create would be number of days per week, days attending per week. This is number of days attending per week of school. And so um, it's a very short answer, but it's related to increasing attendance that uh, maybe the caregiver, maybe the school system, uh, maybe the primary care system, and maybe the child welfare system and the youth can all agree on that particular goal. So I'm gonna ask them how many days in the last week have you um, attended school? The important piece here is that I ask it the same way. And so some people might ask that of the last full week, so just last week, think about out of five days, how many did you go to school? Or you might say, today's Thursday. Since last Thursday's Thursday, how many days did you go to school? As long as you're asking it the same way every time, it's not a problem that you ask it your own way or a way that makes sense to your client. And so let's say that he's gone to school two times. Um, and then as time went on, uh, we found that, or, or the first time I met him was two times. And then when I meet with him today, that now he's gone four times. Uh, many times clients will want to create unrealistic goals that they want to attend every day or get perfect attendance. And it's unlikely that we're going to go from two times a week to five times a week every single week. Um, so I want to have realistic goals for them. Um, next, another measure that might be there. Um, he had talked about flashbacks or when I gave him the child PTSD symptom scale, um, that that information was shared with me um, that he had flashbacks at that particular point. Oh, and I've already made a mistake too in this. And so what I'm gonna do instead of copying and pasting this over, I made a mistake and at the top part here, measures one through four or 30 through 100 and the range of what could be put in there, measures five through eight are less than 30. And so what I wanna be able to do is create measures that um, can be easily read. So I'm gonna just repeat that over. Copying and pasting in some of these tools does affect the programming behind it. Um, and so I'm not necessarily gonna copy and paste here, um, but instead I'm gonna go ahead and, and put in, as I talked about, flashbacks, and then I'll come back over here and I'm gonna put in the child PTSD symptom scale um, and I'm gonna put a cutoff score, which the, the um, five version is, uh, if I can find my greater than, is greater than 31. So I'm gonna have a cutoff so that I know at what point, what am I looking for? And what point is it less clinically um, meaningful um, when the number decreases? And so then, as I was talking about before, number of flashbacks. And let's say he reports that flashbacks are happening very fre frequently. That right now, when I first meet with him on the second of this month, he says that flashbacks are happening 20 times a day. Um, now we might do strategies like self-monitoring and other things like that to be able to improve the data collection, but also to be able to help create awareness around flashbacks and the small changes that are happening over time. So let's say um, we're gonna get the number of flashbacks per day, but then how do I get that as a variable that I can collect, collect once a week? And so I'm gonna say average number of flashbacks per day per week. All right, so that's, I'm gonna ask the question, how many flashbacks on average have you had in the past week every single day? So how many flashbacks per day on average have you had in the last week? And so then they're gonna tell me this number, so we might've started at 20. And now, and, and change is not linear all the time, so maybe now they have 24. And in some of the treatments that we're gonna do, we will see symptoms get worse before they get better. 
Um, but in that, you want to see clinical consultation and supervision for that reassurance and how to stay or manage on track to, to stay the course. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we also added, oftentimes recommend at least two ideographic measures or anecdotal types of measures that you could ask every single week. How many times is this? Or um, how many classes did you get? Or how many homework assignments did you complete? How many um, nightmares did you have? How many nights did you sleep more than four hours? How many nights did you wake up less than three times? And many different variables that are all tied to the client's reason for coming in for services. What are they telling you they're wanting? And through your assessment process, what do you see as the symptoms that are causing the most impairment? Um, but oftentimes I'm letting the client drive this bus, letting them make these decisions. So with the Chow PTSD symptom scale, if I saw them on the second or the sixth of this month, um, then let's say that their score was a 38 when I first saw them. Many times I'm not going to collect the child PTSD symptom scale more than once a month. And so I may not have data at the second point and that's an acceptable thing. Um, some other examples of measures might be, um, so these here, if I add to this, maybe it's the client reporting this. So then I'm gonna put self-report as that. And then number of flashbacks, I'm gonna put self-report. And then maybe the caregiver is in their participation. Remember the mother is involved in that first session. Um, and we do wanna do goal setting with caregivers and others that are involved in children's lives or in young adults' lives. Um, but let's say that arguing at home is something that is a significant issue for them um, and it's causing impairment. So maybe now I'm gonna ask the number of arguments and I can do things shorter if I need to, um, arguing per week. And in this situation, I'm gonna have parent report or you can say caregiver report, depending on what language you like to use there. And the caregiver is gonna say, well, in the last week, um, there were eight big arguments. And then when I ask them again, the next time I see them, I'm gonna say, okay, one of the things that we had talked about, oftentimes I'll bring this up in session. One of the things that we talked about was um, the number of times that he was arguing with you at home and how many times in the last week has that happened? And in this situation, maybe it's gone down to seven. So we have up to four variables um, in each category that we can utilize. Um, some things that might be more frequent, you might be able to find um, that they're in there. So let's say he also is limiting his activities and limiting um, the types of meaningful and enjoyable activities that he's doing and part of affect regulation and affect awareness and modulation is to do more of those activities as a goal. So then we might say number of, um, and I can just use again, initials, positive activities per week. So in this, when we get into positive activities, we could be looking at really high numbers. Um, so oftentimes what I'm gonna do is they might have like a checklist that they can, or a tally list that they can tally every time that they do this. Every time he plays basketball, every time that he talks to his friend on the phone, every time that he listens to music, every time that he goes for a walk, every time that um, he goes and um, hangs out with his favorite teacher, every time that he goes to practice, things that he has identified as mood enhancing types of activities or affect regulating type of activities. And we might have started with 120 and then now we're at 150. Then as I progress forward um, and many times what I'm gonna be doing is I'm just gonna be pulling this or I'm gonna be putting this information in there every time I see them. The goal is that within, I think the, the model is within 48, it may be 72 hours, that this information is entered into the clinical progress monitoring tool. Once it's entered here, Maddie Schneider will have the opportunity to be able to pull this information. She also will be able to lock the current session. So if she pulls that information, she will lock this so that it's not editable any longer. And she will then put in a date that she pulled it and a date that she submitted to the CFO of Egyptian Health Department, who is the lead agency um, for the Illinois Hills Demonstration Project. There's an optional tab here that for those who are doing 
managing and adapting practices or other things that they can think about what is the focus of my treatment and what is the interference. So the focus of my treatment may be trauma, but there might be some interference that might be disruptive behavior concerns. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just keeping in mind that there might be some of the disruptive behavior literature that could help me make good decisions while also focusing on the trauma literature. Connect, cultivate, and consolidate is three phases of treatment, the connection phase or engagement phase, the cultivate or skill development phase and practice phase, and consolidate a maintenance phase of how do I help them consolidate this into their regular life and to be able to maintain this without me. So then I can put in different practices here like psychoeducation, since I'm doing TFCBT, might be in that phase, while relaxation might be in the cultivate phase. And then um, future safety development might be in the consolidate phase for that. While in disruptive behavior, I might still be doing psychoeducation for disruptive behavior, provide that, but I also might be doing a cognitive disruptive behavior type of practice to be able to understand the effects of thoughts that affect how we feel and how we react in disruptive ways. So lastly, I'm just showing that it will graph for you on its own. Um, and the graphing, we will probably do some other versions in the future that might be part two of this that will allow you opportunities to be able to ask questions or more complicated issues and we'll be able to answer those through another webinar. This is a quick overview um, with Liz Cooley, Maddie Schneider and I um, on the clinical progress monitoring tool. I hope that this is helpful and useful. We're very excited about this opportunity for Illinois Heels and to be able to enhance the quality of services and support the time and effort that it takes to be able to do things like clinical progress monitoring in a, in a financial way that can offset the cost to organizations. I hope that this is helpful and beneficial. Um, at the end, um, I'm, I'm, we're happy to be able to have you email questions. Um, at the end of this webinar, you can email those or you can call Maddie Schneider, uh, but Maddie's email address is right here. Feel free to call her, um, feel free to email her um, with questions and we will, she'll get that to the right person to be able to answer those questions as time goes on. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you for participating in this project and we look forward to hearing from you if you have any other questions. Thank you all.